Marc-Andre Amelin, welcome to Cultural Attaché. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yes, um, we last spoke five years ago, so I'm glad that we have a chance to, to explore some new topics. And one of them will be your upcoming concert with Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. And you're going to be playing yes. two pieces on that program. One of them is, is Franck's Piano Quintet in F minor. Um, that's a work that you recorded in... Yeah, you recorded that work in 2016. Um, I'm wondering how much the personality and the musicianship of any given other four musicians makes a difference in the end result of this or any other piece of music that you're performing. It does, but um, uh, the fun, I think, of getting with a, a new group that you haven't played with before is to just to discover uh, um, each other's musicianship and uh, finding common ground and also um, suggesting differences and new ways of doing things that they might not have uh, thought of, you know. So, so um, it's a, it's a, a um, uh, it's an area that's very, very rich in surprises and possibilities. So that's, and, that's, and, uh, and, and that 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 goes for any piece of the repertoire, really. Of course, although there is a more intimate, you know, reliance on a small group of people. I mean. Not that anybody can really hide in a symphonic orchestra because one one something going south in that performance is going to stand out. But I think that you know if if all five musicians in a quintet or four in a quartet, you know whatever number of musicians, small ensemble that it is, there's no place to hide, is there? <laughs> maybe, maybe small ones, you know, but uh, especially with a work that's so well known as the Franck Quintet. I mean, it's really one of the big five, you know, along with uh, Brahms, Schumann, Dvorak, and Shostakovich. Uh, we hear it so often you know, that uh, people sort of know how it goes, or, or at least most of them do. So um, th in, in that sense, there is little uh, uh, room to uh, to hide and to uh, for, for, you know, mistakes or whatever, you know. Um, uh, in a lesser known work in um, belonging to the byways of the repertoire then maybe you know since the the, the piece is not heard very often perhaps it's <laughs> it's it's more acceptable to uh to um um what how, how to say it um to uh to, to be what well, faulty <laughs> i guess <laughs> um uh, but but it it, uh, it it will matter a lot less, I guess. Uh, of course, and we always strive for as much, you know, perfection as possible, or at least uh, um, uh, fidelity to uh, the composer's thought. All right. Well, apropos of that statement, you know, the composer's thoughts. Do you feel like works are museum pieces and should be slave to what the composer's thoughts were, or is there room for, for this music to live and breathe and have its own life in 2024 versus the life it had when it was composed? Well, uh, uh, there's there's several ways of thinking of, uh, about this. I mean, on one hand, you know, being a composer myself, uh, I can, I mean, I don't pretend to have all the answers. Nobody does. But uh, it, it, it uh, being a composer allows you to feel a little closer to the works you perform and especially how they were created. I mean, sometimes you can see the process. Um, <clears throat> so uh, personally, I have a pretty good idea of how my, I want my pieces to go, but there is so much you can do in the way of notation to convey that. And uh, um, so you have to leave something to, uh, to the performer's individual uh, views or, or uh, uh, ways of understanding uh, musical notation. On the other hand, there are several types of uh, different types of composers. Uh, there are composers who will allow uh, great variations of interpretation. For example, uh, I can think of Grieg, uh, who uh, once said to someone, you know, this is not really the way I saw it, but don't change anything. I love individuality. 
And uh, there are other composers who are thankful for any performance, I mean, even though it may fall short of their expectations. I mean, there's there's lots of nuances, you know, within within uh, individual composers' appreciations, and uh, that's what makes the whole world richer. Right now, you're also performing Nadia Boulanger's three pieces for cello and piano, um, mm -hmm. which I think fewer people are as familiar with as they are with the Franck Quintet. What do you think makes Boulanger an important composer? And how does this work perhaps represent what is special about Boulanger? Well, I'm not sure you could call her important. I mean, her output was relatively small. And early on, she actually decided to leave composition aside completely because uh, she was in such awe and admiration of her sister Lily Boulanger, you know, who really had, who she felt really, really had uh, what it took, uh, a, a real composer's soul. Unfortunately, Lily Boulanger died uh, in her 20s and uh, was never able to fulfill that destiny. Um, and Nadia Boulanger later became a, a teacher and sometime conductor instead of uh, being a composer. She, she did write quite a few songs. I mean, uh, she really had something and uh, the three cello pieces, which I'm going to perform, are um, uh, they are in a way rather slight, but uh, certainly interesting enough and intriguing enough to have entered the repertoire um, recently in at least a, a kind of a minor way. But you do hear them, and I'm very, very glad that the, the LACO has uh, decided to program them. Well, and you're not going to just be playing them with with Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra. You're also going to be performing them with with Johannes Moser in multiple concerts following LA Chamber Orchestra, correct? Yes, and we've already done it. Actually, we, we've already had four concerts. Uh, uh, this was some months ago, I think, at the the end of uh, 2023. But we will we'll have some more, and uh, it's a it's a wonderful program. We uh, uh, we start with. Um, the Boulanger, and then um, a, a piece of mine, actually, for uh, a cello and piano called Four Perspectives, then the Debussy Sonata and the Frog Sonata. Sounds so like a, a good very, program. Very meaty cello program, yes. Yes. Um, when we spoke five years ago, you mentioned that you, quote, have the luxury at this point in my career to be playing, without exception, pieces that I really love. How do you think your perspective on what those pieces are has shifted since we last spoke? It's pretty much the same, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I, I keep uh, introducing favorites. Sometimes I come back to, to old ones because it's always, uh, it, it's very healthy and uh, also very fascinating to revisit uh, the things that you haven't played um, uh, for quite a few years. And uh, it's always really uh, startling, I see sometimes, how uh, how much they have changed without you doing a single thing in the meantime you have changed yourself therefore your approach have ch has changed and what and when i play these pieces for myself i play them over after not having played them for many many years they will be completely different and uh, and that's only because of my personal evolution and uh, hopefully my uh, uh, increased understanding of what the composer wants Right. Um, do you find that there are pieces that that intimidate you? I mean, you're so, you know, muscular a player on certain levels, you know, that and even listening to your transcriptions, which we will talk about that in a few minutes. But it's like, it doesn't see I can't imagine that there's anything that intimidates you. Well, you know, I, I'm a little um less inclined quite quite a quite a bit less inclined actually these days to play the, the the big virtuosic things i mean uh i'm much more interested in meaningful communication at this point and rather than showing myself off on stage i mean that's uh, that that that, uh, that to me is is really not very uh very satisfying i mean to me a recital is really a, a one-to-one -one, uh, act of communication and offering it an act of sharing with the audience. I mean, I'm always, always thinking every single second of the audience uh, rather than myself, you know, because what else am I doing this for? Um, I, I, uh, I am, uh, I, I just really adore sharing 
discoveries and perhaps new ways of doing things that people already know. Terrific. You're with this with this chamber concert that you have. You're obviously sharing with other musicians and sharing with yourselves. I happen to think that chamber concerts are some of the most satisfying concerts to go to because of the intimacy of the music, the intimacy usually of the environment in which it, it takes place. But as you well know, most classical institutions, classical music institutions are having problems getting audiences back post pandemic. What do you think a chamber concert offers that you know people maybe haven't realized um, that is more satisfying than a symphonic concert? Well, I, I personally, I don't see a difference because music is music. And, and uh, if, uh, of course, you may prefer a more intimate setting to a grander setting, like an, uh, like an orchestra concert. I mean, that, that's really a personal, uh, personal preference, as I said. Uh, but um, I, I, I think there are immense joys in, uh, in either setting, you know, uh, uh, it, it boils down again to what I said. I mean, I, I, I uh, music should be an act of an act of communication, and it doesn't really matter what it is or how big the setting is, to my mind. Well, is there something you know? You talk about communication. Is there something that you think is is pivotal communicate to communicate to an audience now that perhaps reflects either who you are as a person right now or the times that we're living in? I really concentrate on the music. Um, I, uh, it, 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 to me, I mean, generally, a a, a concert really should be, uh, in the best of times, you know, uh, abstracted from whatever else is happening around uh, around it, you know, in the world. However, I will say this though: the um, the. I think a couple, maybe two or three days after the 2016 election, I was giving an all Mozart concert in uh, at the Y in New York. And so many people at the end told me, thank you, we needed that. And I won't say any more. Fair enough, fair enough. Well, you can always rely on Mozart to get you through almost anything anyway, can't you? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's an inexplicable, it, it, it's, blah. yes, it's an inexplicable effect, you know, but uh, there it is, and we should be thankful for it. Right, now I did allude to your, your new album, which is called New Piano Works, that, you know, has 37 transcriptions on it, um, which I think is, is, is a wonderful album. What made this the right time? 30. How do you count 37? I'm There's 30. Well, there are 37 tracks, I should say. 37 oh, tracks. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, not 37 well, compositions. There's some original thing. 37, yes. Um, but what made this the right time? I mean, this is your first album of material you've composed to be released since Etudes in 2010, I believe. So, you know, why this work and why now? Well, um, I mean, it's it's really more for a practical reason than anything. I mean, uh, I've been uh, very fortunate in having been published uh, since uh, 2011, I believe, uh, by uh, Edition Peters, you know, who are one of the major publishers uh, now. They they originally solicited me, and they, they the first thing they published with it was this volume of 12 etudes, which I recorded uh, along at the same time. And uh, since then, I published a number of piano pieces which hadn't been recorded. So that it's basically a collection of almost everything that I've written for piano since then. It's really quite simple. It's a, it's it's sort of a dull reason, you know. But uh, I've I, I really come to realize very quickly that uh, whether I, I've come to realize rather quickly that uh, even if you publish a score and make the music available. The music is going to be a, a lot more appreciated and more pianists are going to go to it if they can hear it first. So that's why I uh, I recorded uh, these things. So, so you know, the album opens with variations on a theme of Paganini, which is a piece most concert goers or classical music fans have heard for years. How do you approach something 
that is as familiar as that for a transcription versus something that an audience may not know as well? Um, well, it, it was a, it was really a, a fun thing to do, and I, I, I instinctively chose the theme simply because it's one of those things which are so easy, easy to elaborate on. I mean, this, the, the structure is very simple. You got, you have tonic, dominant, tonic, dominant, bum 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 bum, bum and then a, se a simple sequence, the, the, the downward sequence. Uh, it's very easy to remember. And uh, you can riff on it in just a, a gazillion different ways. Um, so um, it's basically uh, a, a piece like that for me is an expression of freedom in, in a sense. But I couldn't resist in having fun, you know, uh, uh, quoting different composers. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, at one point, I mean, I'm sure you heard uh, Narration 7, I think it is. Uh, once I, I thought there's a passage in one of the variations in the Beethoven Sonata Opus 109, it's an E major. I transposed it to A minor and um, uh, uh, for, and for 16 bars, it's already a, a Paganini variation. <laughs> I didn't have to change anything. So uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And I, I, I when I came across uh, this little bit, you know, when I, when I, this came into imagination i thought you know i can't not use this i mean this is too good <laughs> and it happens to be quite funny actually do, do you as a composer have any conversations with you as a pianist in terms of what is truly possible to play versus what you you want to express in the notes themselves at the beginning when i started to write i i just wrote whatever i wanted uh, whatever I heard, uh, without really too much concession to pianistic uh, comfort. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was wondering why nobody was playing my things. I mean, even I had trouble, you know, uh, uh, doing it, I who wrote them. So over the years, uh, as I gained experience, I was able to make things sound the way I wanted, you know, without them being so difficult. And uh, but but I'll always carry that reputation. I think of of uh, my things being almost unplayable, you know, because uh, because of these few uh, first uh, compositions. But uh, I can assure you that, uh, that there's a lot that I wrote which is perfectly approachable. Right. I mean, uh, you know, young young people just jump feet first into the Rachmaninoff third. You know, and uh, I mean, none of the uh, uh, music that I've written recently comes close to that in difficulty. Right, and I think anybody who jumps... It, it, may sound, it may sound like it does, but it doesn't. Right, and anybody who jumps right into the Rachmaninoff third should probably work on a bunch of other pieces before they get to that one. I, I yeah. my, con my concern, having seen young musicians, whether they're pianists, violinists, it doesn't matter the instrument, it's, it, feels, it feels like we're living in a time where people have to make a big impression and get that big applause as if that's what's most important about their life with music and that concerns me well i mean i i can understand it to a certain extent because young people want to uh to uh have a career they have to be noticed and uh they sometimes they do it in extreme ways like that i mean it's 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 i mean it's almost necessary at the beginning but uh the true musicians really uh, uh will i think at one point um uh, realize that there is something else to to a career than just clash and no substance. Yeah, I think I think taking a bow at the end of a first movement is a bad sign. <laughs> right. And I have seen that. I have seen that at Walt Disney Concert Hall. I'm not going to name the artist, but I have seen that. And I thought, hmm, that's 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 a fast track to a short career, if you ask me. There you go. Um, you mentioned that you, you your pieces are not as complicated as as they sound, or maybe as complicated as what you first wrote. Are there other ways in in which you you feel you have evolved as a composer? Well, I uh, uh, I don't think that my my harmonic system, such as it is, because I've never tried to explain it, really uh, hasn't changed that much. Um, 
but I, I, I think if anything has changed, I, 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 I think I've gotten to think more about expressing pure music than thinking in pianistic terms. So, um, yeah, that may be the difference. Right. I saw a 2008 interview that you did with Ethan Iverson. Um, and I think Ethan is a wonderful interviewer and I love this musician. He's amazing. Um, yeah. Conversations that take place, but he was, he was, he was surprised to, to hear that you had a lot of Anthony Braxton in your LP collection in that interview. And then Ethan, Ethan made some comment about how it's impossible for e for most fans to even keep up with everything that he puts out. No, oh, he's, he's been extremely prolific. Yeah. Right. You were equally prolific. And I say that because Hyperion releases are now available for people for streaming, which they hadn't been, you know, without a paywall system beforehand. And in looking on Spotify today, it showed that there was, you know, Schumann Works for Solo Piano came out today, you know, a, a recording of yours. Okay. Uh, so you have, of all the pianists that I can imagine, I think you have a far larger output than most. And I'm wondering how you feel this new way of distributing music, however challenging it might be economically for a performing artist like yourself, how that how that balances out with this newfound exposure that people can suddenly have to you know countless recordings well i think exposure is really uh the priority here and uh, and uh, we should we should be thankful for that because a lot of people uh, over the last few years have complained to me you know that we can't find you on spotify we can find your your early recordings you know on other labels because most of these other labels were on the, on the, uh, available for streaming, but um, the, the Hyperion ones, I, Hyperion resisted for the longest time, and purely for financial reasons. But now that that they have been bought by Universal, you know, by a, a large corporation, you know, uh, now the, the 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 justification is there, and uh, I think uh, people are just so pleased as punch you know, that uh, Hyperion is finally uh, being heard. And the, the, the catalog is uh, a golden treasure trove of uh, discoveries and wonderful, wonderful performances. Right. Not just by you, but by other artists. I, I mean, I don't have to name names. I mean, yes. you, you know. The people who of course. Them. But Hyperion was also one of the most expensive labels. I mean, frankly, to their CDs. Okay. Yes. They and Chando seem to be the two most expensive labels to, to buy physical discs back when, when we did that. Um, you did look a little surprised when I mentioned that Schumann works for solo piano. Is that something that well, you... I thought I, I thought that my whole output had uh, finally been issued uh, just a, a few months ago, but I guess I guess maybe it's not the case. Yeah. But I'm glad that Schumann is available. Certainly. Well, it's, it's it's I guess it's 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 their Valentine's gift to everybody since we're having this conversation on Valentine's Day. There you go. Um, the the concept of of transcriptions and we we alluded to this a little bit before we started we started rolling on this what do you think the role is in a transcription is in allowing listeners new ways of hearing works that they're familiar with or new ways of hearing music that they're not familiar with for that matter well in many many cases it's uh, it's about expanding the repertoire i mean uh, a, a lot of solo instrumentalists are envious of the uh, something like the frog violin sonata and they, they want to play it so there are arrangements for cello for flute and uh, and uh, other solo instruments as well um and uh, but i also uh, like to view transcriptions as well um i've always been fascinated by uh composers views of other composers uh, appreciations of other composers and i think really a transcription is just another way of expressing that uh, paying tribute let's say right i mean, well, think think of uh, what buzoni did with the uh the uh, bach chacon from the d minor partita i mean he uh, he really built a wonderful cathedral of sound you know and uh you can feel i mean there are some people who don't like the transcription but uh, but i personally view it as a tremendous act of reverence for a composer yeah amongst my favorite transcriptions are list transcriptions of wagner i think oh, those really? yeah i think those are really interesting 
because we're so used to Wagner as this, you know, big, huge orchestral thing. And to have it pared down to one instrument, I I think it's I find it endlessly fascinating and a different way of hearing Wagner. The only ones that I've played uh, are the Liebestod and uh, also the Tannhäuser Overture, but uh, that uh, that particular one I, I I don't like pianistically. It it, it it it's an E major and it feels under the fingers like completely the wrong key. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that, you say that. That's just me. <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I I I spent a little bit of time over the years with Stephen Sondheim, um, and he and I were he and I were talking about um the opening music the ballad of sweeney todd um yeah. and he said it's published in in f minor but it sounds so much better in f sharp minor and it's amazing what that half step difference and when he said that and i went to my piano at home and played it i went he's right and it's shocking how even even a half step difference can can have such profound effects on a piece of music well, keys are, uh, are very important. I mean, they have personalities. They really do. I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Moore, the, the, the famous uh, leader pianist, uh, expresses that very, very eloquently. Uh, and uh, he guards against sometimes uh, indulging as far as uh, transposition, uh, uh, transposing, a, a singer's transposing. Uh, because if you... Uh, uh, you can stray too far from the uh, uh, from the uh, the original mood of the song if you uh, if you uh, uh, if, uh, depending you know which key you transpose to. Right. One last thing I want to ask you. Um, it's about something that List is is quoted as having said. He said, "My piano is to me what a ship is to the sailor," and he goes on to say, "It is the intimate personal depository of everything that stirred wildly in my brain." during the most impassioned days of my youth. It, it, is, it was there that all my wishes, all my dreams, all my joys, and all my sorrows lay. What is your piano to you? An extension of my thought. And an instrument of communication and sharing and joy. <laughs>